Hey, Hope City, it's Phil here. Uh, today, as we enter into Holy Week, I want to continue with our series, Knowing and Loving Ourselves, uh, by talking about confession and repentance. And I want to talk about confession and repentance because the one thing that I think we often get wrong when it comes to confession and repentance is the difference between guilt and shame. And here's why it matters. If we get guilt and shame wrong, then we ultimately get confession and repentance wrong as well. Confession and repentance becomes frightening and therefore it's something to be avoided if we don't get um, guilt and shame right. But if we get guilt and shame figured out, then confession and repentance is something that is restorative. It's something that is healing. Uh, like how it's described in scripture. And I think this is what Brene Brown, uh, whose work on shame and vulnerability and empathy uh, has really been life-changing for me. This is what she says about the profound difference between shame and guilt. She says this, I believe that guilt is adaptive and helpful. It's holding something we've done or failed to do up against our values and feeling psychological discomfort. You know, I was shocked when I first heard this. You know, how is guilt adaptive? How is guilt helpful in any way? Because I often figured that that guilt was bad, right? Guilt feels bad. But according to Brene, guilt is supposed to feel bad. Because feeling guilt means that we hold something, we value something in high regard. It means that we hold God in high regard. It means that we hold others in high regard. It means that we hold ourselves in high regard. And so we should feel discomfort when we miss the mark, when we hurt others. We should feel guilt when we sin. So guilt is something that is good. Feeling bad about something we've done or, or failed to do is something that's helpful. Guilt is normal. In fact, the people who don't feel bad when they've hurt others are, are sociopaths or psychopaths. You see, guilt can actually lead us to confession and repentance. It helps us. It reminds us that, that we need to deal with our sin. But you see, here's the difference. Guilt is different from shame. You know, Brene continues on. This is what she says about shame. I define shame as the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Something we've experienced, done, or failed to do makes us unworthy of connection. And I'm going to tell you the truth. Hearing this made me stop dead in my tracks because I'm familiar with shame. I'm all too familiar with the feeling of being unworthy or unlovable based on the things I've either done or failed to do or failed to achieve. And to be honest, I don't know what, whether I, I wrestle with shame as, as the result of being raised in an Asian family where face and shame uh, are an important part of the social fabric or it, perhaps it's my upbringing at church, if that had something to do with it. Or maybe shame is, is just part of our human brokenness. It's, it's one, you know, probably one of the biggest lies that Satan loves to tell us in order to keep us down and to keep us far from the Father's love. And so our experience of shame can keep us from confession, it can keep us from repentance. Our experience of shame can keep us from running to our Father when we mess up. And because of how we're affected by shame, often we think of confession and repentance as a way of making ourselves worthy again of love and acceptance. Whereas the biblical understanding of confession and repentance is so different. You see, Romans 5.8 tells us that God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, and, and I think what he means is before we even confessed, before we even repented or came back or, or wanted anything to do with God, Christ died for us. That before our confession, before our repentance, it's actually God's love 
that is shown to us, that God initiates relationship and reconnection with us when we sin. God takes the first step in his love for us. And it's in the safety of his love that we confess who we are to him and then to ourselves. Romans 2.4 reads, It's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. It's not the fear of punishment. It's not the fear of belonging. It's not rejection, that the fear of rejection that leads us to repentance. It's God's kindness. It's what he has shown us. And so therefore, uh, confession and, and repentance is, is a response to God's initiative of love and kindness in our lives. And it's into this particular human dynamic that, that I want to come back again today to Psalm 139. I want to use Psalm 139 as like a scriptural primer for confession and repentance. Verses 1 to 3 of Psalm 139 reads, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. And the prayer that we have emphasized, you know, as we've come across this passage, in summary, is this. Lord, you know me and you love me. You see, from this passage here, I believe that confession is actually rooted in the solid foundation of God's enduring love for us. How else can David proclaim so confidently, you have searched me, Lord. And you know me. You are familiar with all my ways. He actually celebrates this. He welcomes the reality that he is fully known. He sees this as good news because he knows that he is fully and completely loved. And therefore, confession is not revealing to God something that he doesn't know about us, something that we've done that he, he, he doesn't know about, but, but it's us coming to terms with who we really are so that we can receive the fullness of God's love, all that he has already extended towards us. Because usually in our sin, we react, and, and, and we react to our sin, and, and, and we experience shame, and when we experience shame, we end up hiding. We hide from God, we hide from others, we hide from ourselves. And this is why I want to go to the next part of uh, Psalm 139 with you, verses 7 and 8. And this is how it reads. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I go, if I make my bed in the depths, you are there. You know, I think if I were to summarize this, the, these two verses as a prayer, I, it would be something like this. Lord, you've seen me at my best and you've seen me at my worst. I don't have to hide or pretend with you. You see, confession based on this verse invites us to stop hiding. This passage isn't about God having some sort of constant surveillance over us. This passage is about true friendship where God knows us and loves us through and through. You see, according to the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve had such a close relationship with God that after they sinned, after they broke God's trust by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God's first words to them are not a condemnation, but a question. Where are you? You know, if God asks, where are you? Not because he doesn't know, you know, physically, geographically where they are, but he asks, where are you? It's a question about a relationship where they are estranged from one another. And God seeks to reestablish, reengage, and reconnect with them. God knows that they are ashamed. God knows that they are hiding from him and they're hiding from one another. And so he is seeking to reestablish relationship and safety with Adam and Eve by taking initiative to reconnect with them. 
That's why he asks, where are you? And if you could hear his heart behind the question, I think he's saying, where are you? Because you're important to me. Where are you? Because I can't lose you. You see, confession invites us to stop hiding. Confession is not initiated by us because we want to make things right with God. Confession is actually initiated by God because he wants to reestablish relationship with us. He starts by asking, where are you? He invites us into confession. It's God seeking us out. It's God looking for us. The first question God asks us is, where are you? This is the heart of a parent seeking out a child because having them back is more important than anything that they've done, no matter how wrong or how hurtful it is. Confession is about reestablishing relationship and connection. Confession is about ending the estrangement. Confession is simply about coming home again. You see, God invites us to come to him. He seeks us in our sin. He asks, where are you? And then once we are before him, once we are in relationship with him, once there is safety with him, he asks, what have you done? Not because he doesn't know, but because he wants us to know and he wants us to experience that his love for us doesn't change because of what we have done. I'm going to move on. This is verses 13 to 14, again of Psalm 139. And it reads, You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. If I were to summarize this part of um, this psalm as a prayer, um, it would sound something like this. You know, Lord, thank you that I'm not a mistake. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You see, this this verse tells me that confession is something that not only resolves our guilt, but it takes away our shame. And here's where the difference between guilt and shame really impacts how we approach confession. You see, guilt leads us to say, I made a mistake. Shame leads us to say, I am a mistake. I don't know if you can hear the difference. I don't know if you can feel the difference. I don't know if you've experienced the difference. You see, shame is is a focus on the self. There is something wrong with me. Guilt is a focus on our behavior. There's something wrong with what I've done. I have done wrong. You see, according to this psalm, we can't confess our sin to God without also confessing the truth that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Even though we make mistakes, we are not a mistake. Even though our actions are flawed, we are not deeply and fundamentally flawed. We make mistakes, we definitely sin, but we are not defined by our sin. All of our sin does not diminish the good news that God is our creator. All of our sin does not diminish the fact that we were made in his image according to his intention. All of our sin does not take away the fact that he has placed within us infinite value because we are his children. And I think this is important because it actually deals a death blow to shame. You see, when we come to God in confession, we are invited to confess to God what we have done. And this happens in the context of who we always and already are to God as his children. 
We come to God with both our guilt and both our shame. And he resolves our guilt and we, when we are forgiven. And he takes away our shame by reminding us over and over that we are his children. We are precious to him beyond our ability to comprehend. Confession resolves our guilt. Confession takes away our shame. I'm going to move to the final uh, part of Psalm 139 that I want to go over with us today. And this is verses 23 to 24. It simply reads, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. If I were to to summarize this again as a prayer, it would probably be something like this. Lord, may you lead me from confession to repentance. You see, confession, according to this passage, leads to restored relationship and it leads to renewed living. It leads to a new type of living. It leads to, I guess as David would say, it's the way everlasting. You see, shame is powerful. The fear of being found out, the fear of being rejected because of our sin and our failure is powerful. And shame can be used as a powerful motivator to to try to change our behavior, to change the way that we live. Or at least hide our behavior when we find that we're unable to change or when we struggle over and over with the same set of sin. But here's where I find Brene Brown's work particularly helpful. She actually just just says it like this. I don't believe shame is helpful or productive. In fact, I think shame is more likely to be the source of destructive, hurtful behavior than the solution or cure. I think the fear of disconnection can make us dangerous. I believe that if we want meaningful, lasting change, we need to get clear on the difference between shame and guilt and call for an end to shame as a tool for change. You see, Christian repentance is not motivated by shame. Repentance is not trying to get your act together so that you can be loved, so that you can belong. Rather, Christian repentance is motivated by love. It's motivated by the fact that we all are already accepted just as we are. Yet God in his goodness will never leave us as we are. It's God's love and acceptance that that heals us deep within. It's God's love and acceptance that, that heals us of our shame. And once we have experienced being freed of our shame in our relationship with God, that he can love and accept us just as we are, then we begin to to stop hiding from others. We don't need to hide from others or hide from ourselves. And we can have relationship with others. It's actually the shame and the hiding that causes this destructive patterns, uh, patterns of addiction, patterns that lead us further away from others and further away from God. It's God's love and acceptance that actually enables us, empowers us to ask God to to lead us each day in the way everlasting. That's what repentance is. It's just simply asking God, help me to live in the fullness of your love, in the fullness of your goodness each and every day. Help me to, to, to pick myself back up after I fall down. Help me experience you picking me up when I fall. You see, my prayer for us as a church this week is that the Spirit would actually lead us on a journey of confession and repentance, especially during Holy Week. This is the week where we we journey with Christ closer and closer to the cross. And my prayer is that you would encounter His love for you throughout that journey, but especially as we come on Good Friday to the foot of the cross. I can't wait to celebrate Easter Sunday with you. 
I can't wait to, to, to do our live service with you. I think this is something fun where we, we get to interact in person or at least virtually in person again. But before we get there, I do think we have a journey. And this journey is part of experiencing God's love. This journey is part of experiencing God's freedom, freedom from our guilt and freedom from our shame, that we can come before him and experience him making us new again. A couple question, questions for us um, in our microchurches. Three questions. Uh, first question is this. Uh, when you make a mistake, do you usually feel more guilty or do you usually feel um, more ashamed of yourself? Okay, first question. Second question. How can the difference between guilt and shame impact uh, your practice of confession and repentance this week? Third question, how do the differences between guilt and shame help us navigate everything from the way that we relate to others, the way we parent, and the way we give feedback at work and at school? All right, uh, that's it for me. Uh, look forward to seeing you next week.